Whatever you say, Amelia, but I don't see any other way out except for divorce, Adrian finally said to his beautiful wife. It hurt him to say those words. He loved Amelia and didn't want a divorce at all, but she had completely different plans. Oh, hold me steady. My goodness, you scared me so much, I might faint right now. I've been dreaming about this for a long time. I'm tired of living with a loser like you, his wife said independently. You know what, my biggest failure is you, Adrian replied wearily. You think you're such a catch? Maybe for some unwashed hobo on Christmas. The child stays with me, Adrian sighed again, realizing how powerless his argument was. And indeed, Amelia just laughed. What are you talking about? You've just killed me on the spot. I thought that this clumsy brat would stay with me, and I'd have to nurse him for the rest of my life. How can you speak like that about the child? He finally got angry. He knew his wife could say even worse things. She didn't love him or the child, only money. And when she realized she couldn't get any money from him, she started behaving completely inappropriately. That's why Adrian started thinking about divorce. The apartment will stay with us too, he said. Well, good luck with that. The apartment is mine and will stay mine. And you can sue me till you're blue in the face. And no child will help you here, even if you twist its leg off. Unbelievable, a doctor can't even cure his own child. Well, not his own, but at least adopted, and still can't do anything because you can't do anything at all. You can't even cure a homeless dog, you're more likely to kill it, she mocked him. Every doctor has their own specialization, Adrian replied automatically, understanding that arguing or trying to prove anything to his wife was completely pointless. He just answered out of habit. Matthew was their adopted son. They took him from the orphanage for years ago when they found out that Amelia couldn't have children under any circumstances, even after prolonged treatment. She cried so bitterly when she found out that Adrian couldn't help but offer her this solution. And she agreed. Probably just under the influence of the moment. Or maybe she didn't want people to think she was barren, not entirely complete in any sense. She loved being perfect. So Matthew appeared in their home. A newborn, helpless, squeaky bundle. But Amelia only admired the baby from a distance, quickly losing interest in him. At first, she even seemed to love him, claimed he looked like her, and Adrian, and her mom, and even her grandmother, but demanded that the child have a nanny from the very beginning. I'm still having a hard time, she said. You understand, I never had my own children, never took care of anyone, and suddenly here I am. Let professionals take care of them. And it was professional nannies who first noticed something wrong. The baby's leg movement was somehow off. One heel looked flattened. Examinations began, and it turned out to be a congenital hip dislocation. It's a common problem and not entirely irreparable. But it completely disgusted Amelia from the baby and gave her a reason to reproach her husband. What kind of doctor are you? Couldn't you pick a normal one? She even started demanding that he be returned. Well, think about it yourself, Adrian. Why do we need this disabled person? He's cursed. Let's take another healthy one. Otherwise, he'll limp his whole life and we'll have to take care of him. No, he won't limp if he gets treatment. Everything will be fine and the procedures have already started. But we can't treat a child like this. We adopted him. He's ours. In the orphanage, he could indeed become disabled for life, but we can fix everything. But what procedures could be done for a baby? Mostly massages, and it seemed like it wouldn't fix such a problem. It was too early for surgery, and as a result, the boy, who had learned to walk on time, limped slightly. He'll turn five soon, and then the surgery can be done, but that comes with its own set of problems. Another surgeon should perform it, not Adrian, because his specialization is completely different. And now, on top of all this, there's this divorce. Of course, it's not easy to get rid of Amelia. And taking the apartment away from her is probably not going to happen. On one hand, he's to blame. He put everything in her name as a wedding gift. 
but on the other hand, he had to give something to his beloved. Yes, he loved her, and she, apparently, never loved anyone, not even the one she left her husband for. Adrian seriously suspected that his ex-wife left him for his colleague and rival out of spite, knowing that it would be the most painful blow. The divorce was tough, just like life with Amelia, and in the end, he had to concede the apartment to her. It was easier that way, without any lawsuits or arguments. Fortunately, they didn't end up on the street with their son. Adrian had a little house left by his parents in the suburbs. It took much longer to get to work, but at least it would be quieter. For both him and his son. He didn't need any more nerves to be strained. Amelia wouldn't spare anyone. Let her suffocate in her own apartment. After the divorce, Adrian felt noticeably better. He truly rested his soul. Everyone respected him, the talented young surgeon. At least most of his colleagues did. And especially the patients. Although there were still plenty of problems at work. Where can you escape from them? Mr. Adrian, a generally non-superstitious person, still had one belief. If the first person he met after arriving at the hospital was someone pleasant to him, the day would go well. This time it was such a day. The first person he met was the new orderly, Margaret. She hadn't been working there for long. A very nice girl. Young, attractive. It was strange that she chose this profession. It wasn't prestigious, it wasn't well paid, and frankly, it wasn't very pleasant either. But she herself was a very nice girl, modest, and worked hard. These are the kind of girls you should marry, not all these Amelias, Adrian thought out of habit, greeted her, and went to change. The day was expected to be busy, perhaps even good, but definitely busy. And he didn't yet know how much so. Margaret was also happy with this meeting. She liked the young doctor, although, of course, she didn't even think about courtship or relationships. What love? She had recently emerged from very difficult relationships with great losses. Yes, the first love of a naive and trusting girl ended very badly for her. The young man she believed in, whom she loved with all her heart, turned out to be a real scoundrel. As soon as he found out about the pregnancy, he did everything to ruin her life and eventually not only abandoned Margaret, but also insulted her. As a result, she lost the baby. It was truly very painful. She understood perfectly well that it would be difficult for her alone with the baby, but she wanted him, her little human, who would never be there now. So, after the collapse of this attempt to find happiness, she became an orderly. No, Margaret didn't try to punish herself in any way. She just decided that she had to serve people in some way. And in general, since childhood, she dreamed of becoming an artist. She grew up in a village where there was nothing particularly interesting except for beautiful views and interesting faces. How could she not draw them? And she really was good with a brush. She even wanted to go to art school, but it didn't work out. And then... This unhappy love, illness, depression. Would she never be able to fulfill her dream now? Well, even if so, she would never stop drawing. After all, everyone has some calling. Doctors have healing, and hers is drawing. Even at work, when she had a free moment, she made sketches in her notebook. The head nurse, Miss Vanessa, a strict woman who didn't tolerate idleness, noticed it. What are you scribbling there? she asked, seeing Margaret drawing something in the corner. The girl, embarrassed, showed her. Here, I love drawing. I wanted to be an artist. I don't just make sketches. At home, I use paints, mostly watercolors, but sometimes even oils. I'm not bad at it. Take a look. Miss Vanessa glanced at the drawings and smiled. So why do this? Please tell me. Just translating paper, not to mention paints. Why? The girl replied, hoping for praise. I just love to draw, that's all. You're wasting your time. And you say you paint at home too? Well done. You should do it for a living. I do, but in my spare time. For people like you, all the time is called spare, Mrs. Vanessa said irritably. And then you'll see all the work isn't done. 
There can't be any spare time in the hospital. But I've done everything. That's why I sat down to rest. Margaret tried to justify herself. But the head nurse didn't accept such justifications. Everything done? If you still have time left and the workday is still in full swing, then not everything. Or you did it poorly, carelessly. There's always work in our department. Go, check on the patients in the wards, for example. Maybe someone needs you. Well, this remark could be considered fair, and Margaret, putting aside her notebook, went to fulfill her duties. Actually, a difficult surgery was expected today, and it would be done, apparently, by Mr. Adrian. Margaret mentally wished him luck and the patient a speedy recovery. Adrian, meanwhile, worried about his son. They couldn't send the boy to daycare. The nanny who used to look after him before refused to go to the suburbs, but fortunately, a neighbor came to the rescue. Not young, but very pleasant Mrs. Laura agreed to look after the boy for a small fee. It was lucky. She was a kind woman, got along well with Matthew, and no troubles were expected. But still, while at work, Adrian called several times, asking how things were. And it always seemed fine. The young father was already glad that he found such a good nanny for his son. But apparently, he was glad prematurely because he didn't know everything about this woman and where would he know it from? A pleasant middle-aged woman who could suspect that her past was not very impeccable. She told a little about herself, a widow, no children, bought a house in the suburbs to live closer to nature and also to people. In the city, you know, everyone's rushing somewhere, there's much less communication, and loneliness is not the most pleasant thing, she said with a sad smile. Unfortunately, the details of her life began to emerge only after something unpleasant happened. And it happened on the very day when this most responsible surgery was supposed to take place. Before it, Mr. Adrian, as usual, called the nanny, but she didn't answer. He called again a few minutes later silence. He called the son's phone, but he didn't answer either. It was already strange. After dialing Mrs. Loris and Matthew's numbers several more times, Adrian couldn't take it anymore and called other neighbors, a married couple he knew. Calvin, have you seen what's going on with mine? Well, I mean with Mrs. Laura and Matthew. I can't reach them, he asked the neighbor who picked up the phone. I haven't seen them today, he replied. Wait. Let me ask my wife. The neighbor, an elderly woman who usually knew everything that was going on, approached. Adrian, she chirped, I don't know where they are. I only saw them early in the morning, and then you went to work. So they gathered somewhere and left. I even asked. Laura, where are you going with the boy? And she waved her hand at me and said, for business, she said, we're leaving from here. And I asked her again, why didn't Adrian take you? She said, Adrian can live without us. That's what I thought. She was joking so stupidly, she said with a smile, and you don't even know the truth. Mr. Adrian hung up. This was already scary. Where could Mrs. Laura have gone with someone else's child? Why? Why did she joke so strangely with the neighbor? Or was she not joking? How could he not check her? He didn't find out anything about the person he trusted his son with. He didn't even know where she lived before. But she didn't arouse any suspicions. What's the point of checking a woman of her age? She's already 50 or older. She looks quite decent. Bought a house. And what should he do now? Adrian wanted to drop everything. Run home. Maybe Laura thought to leave at least a note. Mr. Adrian, go get ready for the surgery, they called him. Yes, can't run away from here. But my hands are shaking. Worry about his son's fate prevented him from focusing on the upcoming surgery. Why did she do all this deliberately at such a crucial moment for me, he thought in despair. But you can't cancel the surgery. Especially since it was supposed to be done by a very serious person and there shouldn't be any mistakes here. He sighed deeply. He wrote a short message to Mrs. Laura. Waiting for news from you and Matthew. He turned off his phone and went to prepare for the surgery. Everything went brilliantly, despite the surgeon's condition. 
and only afterward did he see a video message from Mrs. Laura. She stood on the bank of some small river, holding a photo of a man, and addressed him. Mr. Adrian, you are responsible for the illness and death of this man, my husband, Hugh Smith. You managed to escape legal responsibility, but I haven't forgotten how you ruined our lives, and you won't escape from me. Therefore, your son will stay with me. I will also ruin your life. I don't need a ransom. And you will never see your child again. Adrian was horrified by such a statement. Yes, he remembered that patient perfectly well and knew that he couldn't be saved. All the evidence, even from his enemies, confirmed it. The man was doomed. And why should an innocent child now pay for it? What did this elderly woman plan to do with Matthew? And is he still alive? She said nothing more. There were no notes at home, and it was unclear where she was. He went to the police. They said they were starting a search, but there were no results. After several days of futile attempts to find the nanny or the child, he finally returned to work. Sitting in the surgeon's lounge, Adrian endlessly replayed the video, trying to understand at least where Mrs. Laura was filming him. Perhaps this is where she is holding Matthew, and hopefully, the son is still alive. Once, as he was watching the recording, Margaret passed by and also glanced at it, stopped, looked closely, and said, I remember this place. I know it. Mrs. Vanessa, who happened to be nearby, asked curiously, is it your village? Maybe you know this aunt? No, I've never seen her. And it's not my village, but nearby. I went there to paint landscapes. It's not that far, the girl replied. Well, how could you recognize it? The river, the trees, it's all the same everywhere. Maybe it's the same everywhere, but I have a photographic memory. I remember this river exactly. It curves here, you see, and on one side it's like a sandy beach, and there, behind the trees, is a ruined church. Margaret, is this true? Adrian exclaimed. Where is this place? Show me. Since Margaret didn't know the exact name, she got into the car with the surgeon, and they went together to the very place where Mrs. Laura was filming the video. It's so deserted there, Adrian said with concern. There are no houses there. Where could they be hiding with the child? They're not in the video. They're on the other side, behind the person filming. There's a small village there. I don't know if people still live there. Just a few houses. Maybe they only come in the summer. Well, if there are houses, then they could be somewhere, but not on the street. I really hope so. I believe my son is alive. And this woman shouldn't harm him because the child is innocent, Adrian persuaded himself. But he had to warn the police. To say where they were going or to ask them to go with them. Who knows who's there? Maybe she didn't abduct Matthew alone. The police took this message seriously and went after them to arrest the kidnapper and her possible accomplices. Margaret tried to reassure Adrian as best she could. You know, she doesn't really look like a villain, she's a woman. Maybe she just got very upset about her husband's death. But she's not likely to harm the child, it's doubtful she'll raise a hand. The trip turned out to be worthwhile. Matthew was found immediately. He jumped out of some little house when he saw his father's car and was overjoyed. Dad, you found us. The son actually looked fine, neither scared nor unhappy. How are you, buddy? What are you guys doing here? Are you okay? Where is this? Then Mrs. Laura hurried out of the house. She immediately understood that resisting was useless and trying to escape was too late. Adrian and the police ran up to her. She was arrested and taken to the police station. She didn't try to hide anything and confessed immediately. Yes, she kidnapped the child out of revenge and she didn't intend to do anything to him. Not a single hair fell from the boy's head. I'm not crazy, and I didn't intend to harm the child. Ask him, he doesn't even know he was kidnapped, he thinks we just went on a trip. Strangely enough, this was pure truth. 
The boy was perfectly fine, and if he was upset about anything, it was only because his grandmother Laura was taken somewhere. And what were you planning to do with him next? The investigator asked. I hadn't decided. Most likely, I would have brought him back. All I needed was to unsettle Adrian so that he would harm the next patient during an important surgery, and then he would be punished to the full extent of the law. And who would you return the child to then? I don't know. It doesn't matter. I could keep him if there were no other relatives. I didn't intend to ask for ransom, and I had no accomplices. Okay, but your husband died almost five years ago. Why did you decide to seek revenge after such a long time? Because I wasn't in town. I was in prison. The woman explained. Ah, uh, interesting. So you're a convict? Yes, but not for crimes like this, for economic ones, and without any guilt. I was framed. You can reread the criminal case. Everything is clear there. The investigator shook his head incredulously. And who needed to frame you? It had to be my husband's competitor, John Taylor. My Simon was also a very successful businessman, and I was an accountant in his company. And his competitor tried to frame me. They put me in jail, and while I was absent, my husband fell seriously ill. He had heart problems. And during the surgery performed by this so-called doctor, my husband died. And since I wasn't there, I came back practically penniless because the competitors tried to deprive me of everything. They took over my husband's business and all his money, all his assets. He was almost unconscious when they forced him to sign the will, promising to pay me for it. So he bequeathed everything to some caretaker. It's quite strange that you decided to seek revenge on the doctor specifically, not these competitors, caretakers, and who else did you mention, the investigator shrugged. And they would have had to deal with it too. But it all started with the doctor. After all, he was responsible for Simon's death. If my husband were alive, none of this would have happened. How do you know? And anyway, how could you risk the child's life, especially since the boy isn't completely healthy? I'm telling you, the child didn't suffer at all. I didn't intend to harm him. And I didn't. Anyone will confirm that. And what about the person who could have died during the surgery if the surgeon's hand had faltered because of your indulgence? What did he deserve to suffer for? The investigator didn't understand. So that's the most important part. Mrs. Laura, who had been speaking quite emotionlessly until then, suddenly perked up, as if boasting about her scheme. The patient who Adrian was supposed to operate on. That's the same competitor of my husband, John Taylor. Yes, the one who put me in prison, bankrupted Simon. Basically, destroyed our whole family and shattered our lives. Do you think I should have forgiven him? Well, now that's a twist. And the caretaker? What punishment did you invent for her? And what about the caretaker? The caretaker is off the hook. She's a six. After all this mess, do you think she got the money? John Taylor probably slipped her some, but that's it. Just a miserable woman, plus she drinks. She'll probably die soon anyway. And even if I started to take revenge on her, she wouldn't have understood anything. Adrian was shocked when he heard this story. After all, he was least to blame for the patient's death. The patient would have died anyway, no matter what happened to you, fortunately or unfortunately. Did I regret his death? Of course. I visited him at the cemetery several times, and I even erected a monument at my own expense. So that was you, the widow exclaimed. I thought it was one of his friends. I didn't ask. It was awkward to meet former acquaintances after I was released. Yes, it was me, but I'm telling you this not to embarrass you, but to make you understand. And she understood him. This matter couldn't be left unresolved. There was a trial where they had to determine what punishment the kidnapper deserved. But by that time, she had already understood everything and repented. At the trial, Mrs. Laura tearfully begged Adrian for forgiveness and swore that she had never intended to harm the boy. The doctor forgave her, and considering all the circumstances of the case, she was given a suspended sentence. So, 
In the end, everyone reconciled and remained, as they say, at their own interests, except for the businessman John Taylor. Although he was successfully operated on and soon recovered from the surgery, he knew perfectly well who had saved him and harbored resentment, paradoxical as it may seem. But then again, why shouldn't he be angry? He hated the person for the harm he had caused him. Or maybe he was angry because he hadn't caused enough harm. On one hand, he did everything he wanted. He got rid of, that is, put this woman in prison, which not only contributed to her husband's early death, but also ruined him completely. Without his wife, a faithful and talented accountant, he was powerless in financial matters. But why not settle for that? And yet he did not settle. That is, she did not settle, and after all these misfortunes, she decided to seek revenge. And she could have killed him, indeed, by the hands of this doctor. It didn't work out. She ended up back in court. But not only did she manage to wriggle out of it, she also managed to rebuild her life. She even seemed to have abandoned the revenge plan. At least she no longer harbored ill will toward the doctor. And as for him, John Taylor, she preferred to forget. And Adrian himself thought that Laura was guilty of what happened to him, and he was John Taylor. Now he considered not only her, but also the doctor as his enemies. And Mrs. Laura actually became friends with the surgeon. And they even seemed to be quite happy. It was really like that, thanks to the ability to forgive and negotiate. The thing is, during the time spent with the boy, Mrs. Laura really grew to love him. And after the trial, she came to Adrian with new apologies, gratitude, and a request to still let her nanny for Matthew. You understand, Mr. Adrian, I don't hold a grudge against you now. Quite the opposite. And Matthew has become like family to me. After all, I don't have children, so I won't have grandchildren either. I miss that so much. Please allow me to spend time with him occasionally. I'm sure it won't do any harm, she pleaded. Adrian couldn't refuse, because Matthew constantly asked where Grandma Laura was when she would come to him. The father was even surprised at the child's love for a completely unfamiliar woman. But why do you need her? What if she takes you somewhere again, he asked his son. Well, let her. We had a good time, didn't we? She won't do it without asking next time, I promise. But you know, it was great for us. We played, she showed me everything, read interesting books to me, we went to the river, and there was even a goat with a kid there. I miss her, Dad. Please invite her. And Adrian told Mrs. Laura, Well, if you promise not to pull such stunts again or at least warn us about trips, then okay. I still need help anyway. And finding a good nanny, especially in our remote area, you understand, is not easy. Although I dream of some changes in life, but when will that happen? She guessed that the doctor was talking about not ruling out the possibility of eventually getting married. And it pleased her. What's wrong with a young man finally starting a family and his son having a mother? But even in this case, a nanny wouldn't hurt them. That is, she, Mrs. Laura, wouldn't be left out and wouldn't be separated from the boy she had become so attached to. She herself was surprised at how much she loved this child. Although, what's so surprising about it? It's hard to be alone. Her personal life was very difficult. The late Simon was not her first husband. It was an attempt to straighten out her life. Her first marriage, contracted in her youth, was quite successful, that is, normal, but ended in a devastating failure. They lived quite comfortably, though not wealthy. They made plans, awaited the child, were sure they would be happy with their little one. There was no sign of trouble. Laura had a normal pregnancy, no health problems, but as a result, the child was born sick. Their son lived for a short time, less than a year, but after his birth, life completely fell apart. Her husband blamed her every day for apparently being responsible for the child's illness, for now having to live with this invalid for the rest of his life. Laura was already having a hard time, and there was no support. She was tormented by her son's illness, by the constant fear for his life, and instead of any sympathy, she received constant reproaches. 
After the poor child died, as the doctors predicted, she divorced her husband. She realized that she would never get any support or sympathy from this person. He's only good when everything is good. And if so, it's better to live alone than with such a person. Only ten years later did she dare to remarry with Raphael and thought they would be happy and even hoped for pregnancy. But instead, she got what she got. That is, life, as she thought, was over. There was no hope for a new marriage. There were no children. So she expected only a lonely and, alas, impoverished old age and revenge. But now there is no thought of revenge and for what to live then. That's why she came to Adrian to ask to be a nanny for Matthew. Mrs. Laura felt that being with this child was the meaning of her life. And she was immensely grateful to his father precisely for not driving her away, forgiving her, and allowing her not only to communicate with her dear child, but also to be with him constantly. Now she will never harm them, never betray their trust. She felt that not only Matthew loved her now, but Adrian too. After all, my son, if he had survived, would be the same age now. Maybe his health would have been restored, and he would have been just as smart and kind a man. Although, it's probably impossible to be as good. Adrian turned out to be such a noble person. Out of sympathy for her, a lonely woman who had suffered a lot, he did not insist on punishing her for kidnapping the child. And surely he went through a lot because of this. Mrs. Laura really wanted Adrian to be happy. And he was happy. After that trip for Matthew, a real friendship developed between him and Martha. Margaret, I am very grateful to you. If it weren't for you, I don't even know if I would have found my son, Adrian said after everything had calmed down. Well, why not? She smiled. After all, the police and volunteers were looking for him too. I think everything would have been figured out in the end. And most importantly, I think Mrs. Laura would have returned the child herself. Yes, agreed Adrian. And it's good that she didn't harm Matthew at all. But I feel like I've aged ten years in these few days. After all, Matthew is my adopted child, but he's still closer to me than anyone. Especially since he has a problem with his leg. Surgery is pending. Why hasn't it been done yet? Margaret exclaimed. It couldn't be done. Plus, the surgery is quite complicated and expensive. The girl was surprised. Strange. After all, you're a doctor yourself. I'm a cardiologist, but we need a good orthopedic surgeon for this. No, I'm working on it. Almost got the quota. The surgery will be done soon, and Matthew will walk perfectly fine. So I was afraid that they wouldn't find the boy in time and we'd miss the window for the operation. That really worried me a lot. After that conversation, their friendship blossomed, which soon turned into a relationship. Margaret resisted it at first. Life had taught her not to trust people. And despite Adrian seeming completely positive to her, she still didn't believe that they could be happy together. She was unsure of herself and whether she could evoke strong feelings in anyone. However, the young man's attitude towards her shattered this uncertainty and convinced her that not all men were the same. There are those who are worth trusting. You know, Margaret, he said once. I won't lie and say I fell in love with you at first sight, but I thought you were the one worth marrying. I was actually going through a divorce at the time. And our life together and everything after the divorce were quite tough. But with you, it's clear right away how different you are. But apparently, not everyone saw that, Margaret replied sadly. And she told him about her first failed love. After everything that happened, it's very hard for me to trust people and think about new relationships, she said. But you're still very young, Adrian exclaimed, and you should definitely be thinking about that. Plus, don't forget about your main dream. You're a creative person, and being a janitor is definitely not for you. Why not? I provide valuable help to people, and it doesn't really interfere with my painting. Well, almost doesn't interfere. She told him about the mockery from Mrs. Vanessa and other hospital staff. You see, not everyone understands that. But I think you would bring much more benefit with your art, Adrian assured her. 
It's actually your job that might be holding you back, simply taking up your time. Well, yes, work takes up a lot of time and energy. But I still need something to live on. I never became a professional artist, after all. And how could you become one if you're spending days washing floors and serving food? Plus, being constantly surrounded by people who don't understand you, you not only lose time, but also confidence in yourself, Adrian pointed out. Soon they started living together. Matthew took this change positively in his life too. He developed a great relationship with Martha. Besides, as it turned out, the boy also loved to draw. Life together for the three of them turned out to be comfortable and friendly. As a result, two people who had been through a lot couldn't help but understand their feelings and decided to get married. This worried Mrs. Laura a little. She was afraid that the new woman in the house would oppose having a nanny and would decide to raise the boy herself. But Margaret took it very warmly and didn't even think of objecting. The young couple prepared for the wedding. Mrs. Laura was sincerely happy for them, and soon another joy was added. Adrian managed to get a quota for his son's treatment, and Matthew was prepared for the operation. Margaret quit her job at the hospital and threw all her efforts into building family life and, of course, painting. She painted a lot, and as a result, she was noticed. She soon had the opportunity to participate in an exhibition, which, in turn, gave her the chance to make a name for herself. Adrian was confident his future wife would become a renowned artist, and Margaret strove to support him in this belief. Soon they got married. They had a modest wedding, attended by Mrs. Laura. Their ordinary and very happy life began. Margaret worked a lot, attended various exhibitions herself, mingled with already famous artists, showcased her works, and eventually achieved recognition. She was appreciated as a unique artist, and the question of a solo exhibition was almost resolved. The question of Matthew's operation was also moving forward. The boy was admitted to the hospital for preparation, and then another tragedy occurred. Adrian got into an accident. No one was to blame for what happened. It was just a series of unfortunate events. Mrs. Laura, upon learning of the incident, cried and said it must have been the work of competitors or some other enemies, but no. The investigation showed that there were no culprits. There were several fatalities and one survivor, namely Adrian, but he was in critical condition. Urgent blood transfusion of a relatively rare blood type was needed to save him. Naturally, Margaret was willing to donate blood to save her husband, but her blood was not a match. Mrs. Laura offered herself as a donor. As far as I remember, I should be a match, she said. Check it, I'm sure I should be. Her blood indeed matched. Moreover, the doctors were confident that they were relatives. Oh no, hardly. We met not so long ago, she said. Although, I suppose anything can happen in life. Maybe some distant relatives. You have no idea how strange coincidences can be, the doctor told her. I'm sure you're not just some distant relatives, but quite close. And what if, Mr. Adrian, she's your mother? Oh, come on, how is that possible? I once had a son from a new relationship when he was a baby, she replied. Now this is interesting, exclaimed the doctor, who was enthusiastic about genetics, and sent Mrs. Laura's and Adrian's tests for a special examination. The results shocked everyone. They were indeed mother and son. But how is this possible, cried the poor woman. Why am I only finding out about this now, and under these circumstances? Probably someone didn't want you to know. Tell me the date of birth of your child, I mean the one you thought was yours. It turned out that Mrs. Laura's deceased son and Adrian were born on the same day, in the same maternity hospital. And what does that mean? She couldn't believe what she was hearing. Does that mean they swapped the babies? I tried to trace through the documents. You were very young then, and the parents of the boy you thought was your son were elderly people. They had been treated for infertility for a very long time. They needed a child, and the one who was born was sick and not viable. For whatever reason, whether for money or some special relationships, apparently, the swap was made at the maternity hospital. 
So you ended up with an incurably sick son, and that couple got a healthy, viable one. Maybe those who arranged it thought they were doing a good deed. A good deed? For whom? For Adrian's parents? Well, yes, of course. They lived their lives with a smart child, they were happy, and I. Why didn't anyone think of me? My whole life has been a mess. I didn't know a minute of happiness when I came back from the maternity hospital. And then, ten years couldn't shake off the grief of losing my child. And now this. She cried hopelessly. But imagine how happy Adrian will be when he wakes up. He found his birth mother. The main thing is for him to recover soon. Yes, Adrian survived thanks to Mrs. Laura's blood, but he was in a coma. And even his colleagues weren't confident that the once young and healthy man would ever wake up. You can imagine the despair that overwhelmed Margaret and Mrs. Laura. Oh my God, I just found my biological son and, as it turns out, a grandson. I never thought this was possible. And just when I thought life was getting better, this happens. I can't bear it, honestly. Margaret, what should we do? But how could Margaret know? Her husband was lying in the hospital, connected to life support machines. And the doctors no longer believed that he would recover. Your husband suffered serious brain damage, and even if he miraculously comes to, there is no hope for a full life. Therefore, the most reasonable solution would be to let him go, as he could remain in this condition for a very long time. And it's agonizing for both the patient and you. Besides, maintaining his life is very expensive. Can you afford it? They persuaded her. I'll provide as much as I can, Margaret replied firmly. I'll never agree to have him unplugged. That would be murder. I beg you, don't do it. He will wake up, you'll see. I'm an artist. I'll have an exhibition soon, and there will be enough money. She explained all this to the doctors and Mrs. Laura, swearing that she would never agree to have Adrian killed. They'll support him as long as necessary, you'll see. And he will definitely wake up. In the meantime, please stay with Matthew, as he has an operation ahead. Yes, both women, driven mad by worry, rushed between hospitals in a frantic hope that Adrian would survive, regain consciousness, and see that his son was okay. Matthew's operation did indeed go well. The boy was recovering quite briskly, which was not surprising. A young body, the fervent wishes of loved ones, and their prayers were doing their job. But with Adrian, everything was much more complicated. During these difficult days, Margaret was ready to abandon painting, but she couldn't do it now. The upcoming exhibition gave her hope that she wouldn't be so completely dependent on the will of the doctors who didn't believe in her husband's recovery and were almost insisting on disconnecting him from the machines. Mrs. Laura was also terribly worried about this, but of course, she couldn't help in any way. Everything boiled down to money, which neither of them had. Maybe I should sell the house? Mrs. Laura timidly asked. You can sell it, probably, but it will take a lot of time, and how much money will you get? Your house, excuse me, is small and old. How much did you buy it for? Well, practically for nothing. And you'll have to sell it even cheaper, given the urgency. These funds will last only for a few days. So it's not worth it. It's better to pay more attention to Matthew. That's very important. So that by the time Adrian recovers, his son will be fine. Oh, Margaret, if you only knew how important all this is to me. How I want to be with my son, talk to him, find out everything I can. We lived apart for so long and didn't even know about it ourselves. Oh, don't despair. The exhibition is coming soon. I hope everything will work out. I'm ready to work day and night so that Adrian wakes up because we need him so much. Yes, Adrian was needed by everyone, the family, and even the hospital, where they were also waiting for his recovery. All hope remained with the exhibition and new orders. And then something happened that no one could have expected. It turned out that the exhibition burned down. It was clear to everyone that it was arson. And surveillance cameras revealed who did it. 
It turned out to be none other than businessman John Taylor. It's quite difficult to understand what happened to this person, whether he went mad with anger and envy, but something similar apparently happened. He couldn't bear that the people who had not become objects of his hatred were doing fine. Knowing perfectly well Adrian's current condition, understanding the hopes that his relatives were pinning on this exhibition, he decided to set it on fire. Paintings of not only Margaret, but also some other artists perished in the fire. Fortunately, no one was injured. This alone saved John Taylor from prison because he managed to compensate for the material damage, naturally, using his assets, which led to his complete bankruptcy. But in Adrian's family, such happiness occurred. Matthew, who had successfully undergone the operation and rehabilitation, was completely healthy. After being discharged from the hospital, it was decided to take him to his dad. I'm not sure if your decision is right, Adrian's doctor hesitated. The boy underwent surgery, which is quite a serious stress for the body, and you want to subject him to another trial. Are you sure that visiting a seriously ill, practically dead person will benefit the child? I'm not sure. Adrian is not dead. Margaret exclaimed. I don't understand. How can you, doctor, say such things? He's alive. And I'm sure he hears everything. But still, don't forget that the boy is only six years old, sighed the doctor, but he allowed the visit anyway. Matthew entered the room timidly. He, who had recently undergone considerable physical suffering, was afraid of causing discomfort to his dad. Don't be shy, Matthew, Margaret encouraged him. Approach your dad, talk to him. His eyes are closed. Is he asleep? The little boy asked quietly. I don't know. You see, no one knows that right now. Dad, hi. Approaching his father's bed, the boy leaned over him. I've been discharged from the hospital, and they told me I won't limp anymore. Open your eyes, look how I walk now. I can not only walk and run, but also play soccer and ride a bike. As he spoke in this way, he became bolder. He forgot that something was wrong with his dad. So get up soon. Now we can do everything together, walk, play. Aren't you happy? Why are you silent? Why don't you open your eyes and see how I've changed? The child was ready to get upset. Margaret was about to take Matthew away. But he still didn't want to leave, still hoping to hear his dad's answer. And suddenly, the voice of the son broke through Adrian's oblivion. He slowly opened his eyes. I hear, he said weakly. I hear, son, and I see, of course. We'll go wherever you want. And where's mom? Matthew, for whom Margaret still remained an aunt, looked at her and took her hand. She's right here, dad. And we'll take grandma with us. Where's grandma? Mrs. Laura came closer. Adrian, my dear. She said, holding back tears. I'm here with you. I'll always be here with you. You know, I found out something like that. I never thought I would find you. I didn't even know I lost my own son, she said. I knew, Adrian suddenly said. I don't know why, but while I was lying here, I somehow found out all about it. Found out that you're my son? Mrs. Laura was amazed. But what about your parents? You remember them, don't you? Well, of course. I remember everything. They were good people, but they're gone now. And it's too late to figure out why it happened. But the main thing is that we're together now. Right, Mom? You'll always be with us? Well, of course, Mrs. Laura cried, hugging him. You're my family, the dearest people to me. I have no one else but you. Finally, the doctor escorted them out of the room. The patient, who had unexpectedly come back to life, needed to be examined. The women walked away, crying tears of joy, while the boy comforted them. Why are you crying? Dad woke up. He'll recover quickly now, you'll see. It's you, dear, who woke him up, Margaret wiped away her tears. Certainly, Adrian still had a lot of time to spend on recovery and rehabilitation. 
but he wanted to get back on his feet as soon as possible to become a fully functional person. He had someone to live and work for. Neither the doctors nor he himself knew when complete recovery would occur. But Adrian eventually walked out of the hospital on his own two feet. Of course, the whole family greeted him. Everyone was happy and confident that nothing would overshadow their happiness anymore. I'm sorry about your paintings, Adrian said, already aware of the fire and John Taylor's involvement. Do you really think that setback could deter me from my beloved work? Margaret laughed. I wasn't particularly upset. My last paintings were, frankly, so gloomy, but they were painted in that state. But the compensation we received is so significant that we need to decide what to do with it as a family. For example, we can spend part of it on buying a bigger house and set up a studio there, and there will still be some left for an exhibition hall. We agree, everyone replied in unison. And six months later, Margaret, returning from an ultrasound, delighted everyone with the news that they would have a girl.